I, I really want to introduce more than anything the next speaker, who uh, is a dear longtime friend of mine. But this guy is deeply, deeply involved in the sport. Uh, we got Tony James, who is on the board of the, uh, the British Falconers Club. He's active with the IAF. He's deeply ensconced in the uh, British Falconry archives now, not to mention the fact that he is an absolute hood nut and uh, is a hell of a book collector. And we've used all of his talents and profited from all of his talents for a long, long time. And I cannot give you a better speaker to tell us a bit about hawking uh, than Tony. Come on. It's all yours, buddy. Good morning. Thanks very much for the welcome and thanks for uh, putting the pressure on Kent wherever you went. <laughs> I, um, I wanted to talk about something, just a really simple thing, how to share with each other to improve each other's lives and each other's falconry. Um, I'm interested in the development of falconry cultures. I, sh I should say what I am as a falconer with an interest in that. I'm not a historian with an interest in falconry. Falconry is everything to me, like, as it is to you. But I'm interested in the development of falconry cultures, and each one of us has gone through that same development it's in miniature of, of what is a national culture. And the American culture, falconry culture, has, has, has influenced everybody in the world. Ken has, has often said, mistakenly, I believe, he talks about... Britain having an unbroken falconry culture is not entirely true. For a century, falconry had almost died in Britain. And like yourselves, we, we had to, to redevelop the skills, relearn the skills. In your case, you had to learn the skills. And you did it really, really well. Um, British falconry has, a, has an incredible history going back centuries. But we did have to start again. And as a way of illustrating it, I'd probably like to talk about my own personal falconry, which began, like most of you, as a small child. You were drawn, you were drawn to it for some magical unknown reason. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, reading the latest NAFA biography, and I'm really sorry, I can't remember the chap's name, he was asked his favourite falconry quote, and he said it was falconers are not made, they're born. And there is some truth in that. Each of us, as small children, found ourselves interested in birds, in nature, in, in animals. And we did, most of us, or probably all of us, didn't know falconry even existed. We were just drawn to these things. And the development from knowing nothing to where you are, are today is just an incredible journey, you know, whether it's individually or nationally. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about my development. And it, just bear in mind that it's just a microcosm of what actually has happened nationally, particularly in America. The journey is pretty much the same. When I began, I, as a 13-year-old, I managed to find somebody who kept hawks, which was a rarity in England at the time. But he wasn't a falconer. I didn't know that at the time. And um, I'm forever grateful to him. But from, from there, it, it kind of I learned from that first kestrel. That's, that's what we began with. And very quickly, I found myself as a 15-year-old in possession of an enormous three pounds, two ounce, wild taken Finnish goshawk. And um, like all of us, when, when we catch our first rabbit, when we catch our first head of quarry, we think we're falconers, we think we know it all. Um, from there, a passage, um, a passage lugger falcon from Pakistan. As a 17-year-old, I was flying 
Flying the Falcon and the Goshawk. And I truly believed I could write a book. Um, <laughs> and, and I'm sure that strikes a chord with a lot of you. That, the Dunning-Kruger effect, is it? We, we believe we know it all. And as Mark said, you start to, to realize you go through stages and you realize you don't know anything. I was lucky, I left school at 16 and I went to work for a, an incredible falconer, Nigel Warrington on Salisbury Plain. I haven't got any photographs from the time, but uh, this shows all of us on a later grouse hawking trip. I went to work for Nigel as a 16-year-old, believing I knew it all. And any of you that know Nigel will know that he's quite brutal. And he very quickly told me that I didn't. <laughs> And uh, I, so I, I spent my days believing I knew it, being shouted at, being told that I didn't. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? And I argued because I was 16. I, I, I knew it, I knew it. Um, we kind of developed it together. You know, he was an excellent falconer. And I was at a stage in life where, where I was keen to learn, uh, grudgingly. I didn't want to admit that I was learning from them. And, and like many of us, it, we kind of live in this isolated world where we believe we, believe we invented falconry. At the beginning, we, we, we kind of imagine that nobody else has done it as well as we've done it. And. Um, yeah, I was lucky enough at that time, this picture shows uh, Nigel out with Roger Upton. Roger couldn't have been a, a, a nicer gentleman, more encouraging. It's, I found myself just fortunate to be in the company of incredible people. Um, I'll flick forward. Some of you will know Leonard Potter, Jack Maverick Godardo. These were people that I used to visit 16-year-old on my moped, your little scooter thing. And um, with, without knowing it, these, these guys were, were instilling in me, not just, it, and probably in Mavro's case, certainly in Leonard's case, nothing particular in terms of the practice, but they were, they were doing that really important thing, inspiring a young man. And with, without that inspiration to, to spur you on, to want to learn, it, you just couldn't do it. You need the inspiration. From there, of course, you start learning from, from the hawks themselves. That's kind of the next stage. It, it, you read the hawks. You, as a young man, you become so connected to them. It's everything. So you develop your skills just slowly, gradually, without even realizing how it's happened. But it, most falconers that started as young children develop, you know, they think like a bird. They, they believe they, you know, the contact is greater than, than anything you can develop later in life. This is a little picture of um, Merlin's at Hack in my garden. I didn't know at the time when I first did it that Leonard Potter talking about hacking peregrines in Till's head for Gilbert Blaine at the time. He, all of the things he talked to me about, you know, hacking 17 peregrines at one point, the most he ever hacked, not losing one of them, the conditions, all of the, every little detail sinks into a young mind and you, you Often you don't even remember it until years later. The silliest little things, just home life. Ronald Stevens maybe is, is a big inspiration through his writing. Hawks have to be comfortable. That's your life, that's your role to make sure those hawks are comfortable. So we kind of, we've had the inspiration to begin with. We develop the skills with the birds themselves. Unknowingly, we're sucking in all this information. 
And once again, you get to this point where you believe you know something. You believe you know it all. You're in the field, you're having success. <laughs> what could be better? You've, you've done it. You've reached the top of the tree. You know what you're doing. And then you meet friends that you didn't even know existed. <laughs> and, um, and you realize, actually, you're out of your depth. There's, there's a whole big world out there. There's people that know so much more than you do. And they share it. They're kind enough to share it. And in Hub's case, gentle enough to share it without saying, that was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this, this picture shows, obviously, this was the first year of the GPS, so I think seven years ago. Hub came over and visited, and um, we hit the grouse moors first, I think. I think this was the second week back on the low ground. And um, these developments, again, every little aspect of that picture makes me smile. Because Hub, sorry, Robert, Hub at the time, he didn't believe this thing was going to take off. <laughs> but uh, yeah, these these innovations, these people, the sharing of of knowledge, sharing of equipment. As Kent said, he described me as a bit of a hood nut. You know, from what Kent said, the development of the hood, for example. It's down to some of you guys here. You know, it, it, we did have these these old European hoods. People of my age made hoods and got by, but it was taken to a whole different level. And it's all to do with sharing. Everything is sharing. Um, I know Jim Ince is is here somewhere. Uh, various various hood makers over here, in a small way, changed my falconry, change falconry worldwide. GPS the same, hub the same. I haven't got my glasses here. Oh no, this is not hub, this is Dave Eslicker. Another guy like hub, obviously an exceptional falconer, a real gentleman, and he shares his knowledge without being brash, without being, without being arrogant. <laughs> the best kind of sharing you could possibly hope for. And this, this is Dave, uh, a year or two after Hub visited, loving every moment. And I remember, I remember this day, Dave talking about uh, refined falconry. And I'd never heard the expression, never considered, because it was something we all aspire to, refined falconry. That particular flight was was it. It was the day when when Dave spoke of refinement. A seminal moment in my life was the IAF, the IAF meeting in Cezanne in France, 2007. Again, I, th I thought, I'd, at the time I went there, I. Th I th Robert will probably remember I was a bit of a know-it-all then. But all of a sudden, meeting these falconers in France, falconers from all around the world, the bar went up. All of a sudden, I didn't know it all. There were people, Jose Manuel from Spain. Um, I'm trying to think, Karl-Heinz Gersman was there, various people. These people just eclipsed anything I'd ever seen. Jose Manuel, just an excellent falconer. At the same meeting, sorry, Mark, I haven't got a picture of you at this meeting. It was the first time in my life, being being British, we're we're notoriously bad at helping the next generation, and that's what's held held us back. It's it's not as I've often heard. It's not that we're bound by tradition. We're just awful at passing on the knowledge. Um, so we ended up taking the, the, much of the knowledge from what you guys found in America. And after you'd eclipsed us, it was time for us to pull our shoes up and, and, 
and get going and trying to do it. Robert will recognize this one. The contact between falconers, skilled falconers around the world, just over a dining table, makes such a difference. Every little conversation makes a difference because each of us takes something away from it. We don't know we're taking something away from it at the time necessarily, but we are. Mark, Robert, all the guys that I met there for the first time, apart from having a whale of a time and, and laughing like children, I certainly went away and I hope others went away from that meeting, as, as I hope we will from this meeting, with just something more, something more that adds to our falconry. That meeting led to, with me to a great friendship with Jean-Claude, who was the, the host of it. And I've spent the last, I don't know, 2007, so the last 15 years, going back there, you know, engaging with French falconers and falconers from around the world that he invites there to enjoy some of the spectacular opportunities. Perhaps nobody could have really had so much influence on my falconry by bringing me together with, with other falconers that were just a level above. Here's, here's Dave in the kitchen with an English falconer on the right, and Chris, a friend of mine, and a German falconer in the middle, Alex Prince. Again, an exceptional falconer. He, he learned immensely from the likes of Christian Saar, initially Christian Saar, Eckhart Schormeyer, German falconers. But again, his life was, was elevated by meeting people at meetings like this, being invited out to, to go hawking. Yet with, again, with people that could just show, each, each time there was just this little improvement. So over the years, each of us, we all began knowing nothing. And then gradually over the years, the, the learning curve just took us to places we didn't believe was possible. Talking of hoods and hood nuts, this Bill Barber here, an American falconer, with Christian Saar, maybe five years ago. And I wish I had more photographs with Christian Saar's smiling face. He, he declared this was the best hood he'd ever, ever put on a hawk. You know, Bill has learned from Jim and learned from others. Again, it's just that progression all the time, just adding something more to our falconry. Uh, Mark's talk earlier, he talked of, of falconry in the Arab countries, and he did it brilliantly. I, I could only find one photograph. <laughs> so, again, my, my time was kind of limited over there. I'd, I only had a couple of weeks with them. Mark had a lot longer. But even falconers that spoke no English, you know, Qatari professional falconer, there were things that he showed me that I'd never considered, even though we didn't speak, we didn't share a word of, of common language. It was just exceptional. And all of, all of those things, all of those relationships, it ultimately kind of, led me, I, I, I've always enjoyed my falconry from when I knew nothing to now when I know something. Um, Kent was talking about our long time friendship. Kent's been inviting me here for 20 years. Um, this time I came because John invited me to speak and I only agreed to speak so that I couldn't put it off another year. Not because I've got anything particularly worth listening to, but uh, the archives inspired us back home to, to do the same thing, very much smaller scale, very much less impressive than, uh, than you'll see later. Yeah, the archives here is just incredible. But the British archives, we're, we've got the history, we're, we're a kind of fledgling organisation by comparison. We're one step up from the broom cupboard that the archives started in. 
let me just flick past these and show you some of the kind of things. I'll come back in a moment if I can find them. Things like this, Chris, Chris at the back there, this, this sums up the, the sharing of that knowledge and sharing of the inspiration. History, oh, oh wow, I didn't realize I talked so long. Um, yeah, Roger here, this, this was getting near the end of Roger's life and he was desperate to show Chris this, this book he'd done. It's not been published, but was desperate to share it. And that, that is it, that it's sharing. Just a quick word with um, falconry literature. Yeah, we share with each other. So I had a conversation about hawking golden plover outside with a young guy, and both of us took something from it. Falconry literature gives us the chance to learn from people after they've gone maybe by hundreds of years, there's always something that you can glean. Every, every book is worth reading. Um, you know, there's, there's people here that say, I was talking about their books earlier, with things in there that make a difference. So I'm not a historian, I'm a falconer, but yeah, falconry history can teach us something. Ronald Stevens, for example, just a little quote from him. The kind of thing you could so easily miss, but just a fascinating quote, just food for thought, just something to, to up the level. I'm gonna have to stop in a moment, so I haven't had a chance to show you the, the slides at all. But um, I'd like to thank there's so many of you, Hub's looking directly at me, so I'll <laughs> say Hub. I'd like to thank all of you and a lot of you people have, have made a big difference to my life and my falconry. So, um, yeah, thank you. I, I, yeah, I, oh, sorry. I should have put my glasses on this the time. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. You know, when, when I saw you were speaking, it was, it was a, a great joy for me because I thought, I, he's, he's just a fun guy. But it was a very deep subject. And what you, you just skimmed on the top of it, but for many of us in this room, um, I think we can relate to that. And it, depending at different stages of our lives, it has more meaning and significance. But if there's one thing I would take away from this and what you were trying to articulate is never underestimate that um, as a falconer, you just doing your own thing and you, you, you do what you think is, 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 is falconry, but never underestimate something you say or do or, or a gesture you offer and the impact it has on somebody, maybe not quite as far ahead as you may have been at the time in your, in, in your falconry. Um, there's people in this room, many of them actually, I can look back at and say, you know, they've made a big difference to the way I practice my falconry, and you touched on the fact that it's raised the bar. You know, my seven years in the Middle East opened my eyes up because they did something different to the way I did it, but it didn't make it right or wrong. It, it's just different. And um, it, this gives us a greater understanding, and it opens our eyes and, and uh, raises the bar, as you say. And um, I, I would just concur with what you're trying to say is really... Um, sharing this knowledge, sharing our experiences. Some people are ready to receive that information, some are less so, but don't ever underestimate the impact you have on a fellow falconer, uh, wherever stage they are. And I can tell you this now, I've learned a lot from apprentices than I've learned from master falconers as well. Um, but sharing that knowledge is really what matters and, and is gonna ensure that the, the future of, of our sport, because it really is on the people that's gonna follow us. But thank you. No, thank you. We, t we never know where, where the next gem is coming from. You know, whether it's something in Steve's book, whether it's something in Ken's book, whether it's a, a, a very gentle comment from Hub. 
you know, I'd learned from so many people. And, and you don't realize it. You don't realize you're learning from such wide sources. And the only way folk can, can really develop is, is when it gets to the stage when there's enough people to look outwards and aspire to that and aspire to that, take, take this, take that. When there's, you know, British falconry suffered it when there were so few people for a century or more, when there were so few people to compare notes with, you don't have the opportunity to, to develop, not in the way that you can when there's a lot of people doing fantastic things. So we're kind of at the stage now in world falconry where we're, we're pretty much there with the best times that have ever been in terms of sharing, sharing knowledge. You know, and it's so easy to share now. It's just whether people are willing to share it. me up for our first date with a goshawk in the car and a German short herd pointer that was growling at me. And he asked if I minded if he took the, and the hawk was, you know, uh, being aggressive. And he asked if it'd be okay if he took the dog and hawk home before we went to dinner. And I told him I'd prefer it. And um, then we just, we just clicked. And He'd tell me about when he was a little boy uh, on a farm laying on a chicken coop roof watching red tails soar. And he knew that that was a hawk. He loved it. He knew that there used to be falconers a long, long time ago, but there was none left in the world. Yeah. And he was going to have to learn all by himself. And that's how he got started. He went and got a red tail, and he started learning. But the sharing has been so huge in my life and it's been just such a delight. We've always lived in a tired old farm ha house and cooked on wood wood and cook stoves and done everything, you know, primitively. But I, I look back on my life now as I'm getting old and I think of myself like Wendy and Peter Pan. And I got all the lost boys and they were just darling. And they weren't old enough to be crazy about girls and they ha had a passion, and they were old enough to listen and learn, and um, Hub's one of my boys, and he was a little bit older. He was driving. Tom Meckley was one of my boys. The first time he drove a car by himself, he drove from Chicago to our house, and he had to mesh, fit into the traffic when you go down a ramp, and he was so grateful to make it to Roscoe, Illinois, and still be alive, and anyway, I have a lot of boys. And um, it's just been a blessing. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so um, they shared and we shared and we've, you know, turned into families. But um, it's all good. You know, yeah. it's all good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Tony. <laughs> we got it. We're running short on time. If you could make it quick. Thanks. Is this, can you hear me? Yeah. So um, this... Me coming from both sides of the Atlantic, seeing the old world and the new world, there's very difference in the, in the traditions and the understandings of certain things. For example, I was talking to people last night about the concept of freedom. Freedom in the old world is freedom from. Freedom from disease, freedom from poverty. In the new world, it's freedom to, to do this, to do that, which has been translated into the traditions of, of falconry, I believe, in the old world, the traditions are more about a way of life. In the new world, it's about the biology. So Tony, what do you think are the things that falconry should look to do? Like, you know, there was always a problem of getting the bird high. So ballooning came in, you got t you know, telemetry and things like that. What else do you think we should be looking at? Maybe. I, did, I think the most important thing is for each of us, there's so much knowledge in this room, so many people with so much experience. And sometimes it's difficult to remember what it was like to be one of the boys, one of, one of those boys desperate to learn. Not everybody's gonna make it, not everybody's gonna come through. But without 
each of us sharing something with them and trying to give something. The, there was going to be a quote from uh, Emperor Frederick about helping the art progress closer to perfection. It can't happen unless each of us remember that we need to share too. You know, we've all taken from, from other people, we've all stood on other people's shoulders. If we if we forget to pass it on, you know, some of the guys here have done it through literature, some have done it through through personal contact, but we've we've got to look at the next generation. Yeah, we can't just be a bunch of old boys together enjoying ourselves. We've got to have boys of our own. You know, we've got to pass it on. Sorry, yeah, <laughs> lovely. We're uh, sorry, guys. We're running out of time. We got to move on. Thank you, Tony.